let's proceed to the second segment of our unpanel so here we have three more speakers with you um and towards the end of that segment we will have another q and a session we'll keep it a little brief this time so let me introduce the next three speakers to you very very quickly the fourth talk that we have um is mihir samson covering love in the time of online harms and policing Mihir practices law in New Delhi and has been part of significant cases relating to the rights of LGBTQIA+ persons including section 377 and the recognition of the rights of transgender persons. After that we have Smriti Parshira speaking on leisure loitering and urban surveillance. Smriti is a lawyer and tech and society researcher who's currently working on a research project with the Intel Ledger Foundation which focuses on studying digital financial access in Himachal Pradesh. and third and to conclude the evening we have dr anand tel tumde joining us remotely to talk about dissent and privacy anand is the former ceo of petronet general secretary of the committee of protection of democratic rights education rights activist and president presidium member of all india forum for rights to education and he's also the scholar and author of over 30 books so with that can i please invite the next two participants on the dais uh, anand has joined us remotely and i would request um, mihi to take the stage Thank you and good evening, everybody. I am uh, very happy to be here to celebrate uh, the Puttaswami Judgment, which came in August 2017. Uh, for us in the queer community, it was really a source of hope because it came at a time when 377 had been reinstated in 2013. The situation on the ground was very dire. <coughs> Excuse me. And basically, violence was rampant, blackmail was rampant, sexual assault was rampant. Thank you. and really this privacy judgment was a death knell to 377 because it said that the reasoning in kaushal was wrong so we knew then that it was a matter of time till the shadow of criminality was lifted off us since we've been talking about aadhar i must say that for trans people the lack of uniqueness of aadhar has been very useful let me put it like that because after the nalsa judgment in 2014 the state started recognizing trans people but you had to follow the same system of changing your name so you had to publish it in the newspaper so you had to tell everybody identify as a trans person this is my chosen name this is my chosen gender and then you could change all your ids 2019 they've now passed a law where you approach the district magistrate you have to apply online through a single portal forget any uh, digital safety the portal was so badly designed that you could put in an application number and access anybody who had applied for a window of period uh, that's how bad it was you could access everybody's personal information including their gender identity but because the system is so cumbersome basically people are going to an aadhar center paying 200 rupees and just saying that gender is recorded by mistake and correcting it so they're getting the aadhar in the correct gender without doing the legal uh, sort of requirements and moving on with their lives and then uh, following up uh, whatever needs to be done i mean so that's the uh, the loopholes are so many uh, there's no guarantee that it's accurate but trans people are using it in a way to move on with their lives and not being forced into the incorrect gender <coughs> So I'm here to talk about relationships. I'll talk about um, the experience of queer and trans people with the law, particularly, but not just in romantic relationships, but also platonic, chosen, familial relationships. Because for us, our relationships are very often uh, causing us to be at odds with our family. So by choosing your own partner, by choosing a partner your family doesn't approve of, you are then on the outs of your family so far from being a sort of private thing between two people or however many people one would choose there is the state uh, involved in the relationship through the police and there is the family involved in the relationship through uh, their disapproval and so often what we have to do as lawyers is to be at the police station to ensure judgments like uh, the puttaswami judgment and the following naptev judgment etc a follow because if we're not there basically what the father saying becomes the law 
what the Supreme Court has said, what the Constitution said, is completely ignored. So that's really what we're trying to do is to make sure that uh, the law is followed at the police station and people who um, are in relationships are able to be so without uh, the threat of criminal action. So I just want to say that, you know, it's only been six years since uh, 2018, since 377 was finally put to rest uh, insofar that it act applied to consensual acts between adults. But really on the ground, the situation has changed. It's almost unrecognizable in terms of people's expressions and the ability to connect with other people. And so for people in places where there's no discussion about um, sexual orientation, about being trans, about being queer, um, the phone is really something which allows you to access uh, information, communities, services. It's quite literally um, aligned to your freedom. Apart from that, it also allows you to express yourself in your correct gender. So you might be in a situation where your family won't let you cut your hair. They won't let you dress the way you want to. They won't let you meet anybody. Your ability to express yourself is so heavily restricted, particularly for queer women and trans men, that the only way you can kind of lift any dysphoria, that's discomfort with your uh, sex assigned at birth, is to express yourself online. So really you can not only be yourself, but also find your community online. And, and we're seeing it play out in very interesting ways. So just recently, we had a case where a trans woman had been confined by her parents. She tried to go to the police station. The police station uh, alerted her father that she had left. She got assaulted at the police station and then sent back to her father's house. Her father then put her in a de-addiction center to sort of say that there's something wrong with her, etc., uh, so that she wouldn't be a nuisance in the area. Now, she didn't have any friends uh, in her college because she was being bullied for her uh, gender expression, but she happened to be very active on Discord and actually had a network of very, very close friends who she had not met, but were willing to come to her rescue. So um, they were willing to act as petitioners in the court, come and interact with the judges, seek that she be produced and released from the family. So for, for queer and trans people, it's not just, you know, your sexual and romantic relationships, but also your chosen family. Uh, it could be accessed and created through uh, online spaces and networks. At the same time, of course, the phone can be used to track you. So say you are leaving your house because you know that if you come out or your partner is found out, your call location, your sort of your phone location can be used to track you very easily because basically what happens, and it seems to be a pattern now everywhere, is that the family goes and says you're missing. You might have left a letter, you might have uh, even left a letter in the police station. Everybody knows you might have left on your own, voluntarily or an adult but you are deemed to be missing uh, when the, your parents go and report you. That then activates the entire criminal uh, process. So the police must, in their minds, find you, ask you whether you've left or not, and unless there's somebody else present there to ensure that the law is followed, they will take you back to your uh, hometown in the police station where the complaint is registered, and then very often threaten you and send you back. So for us, we have to constantly negotiate with people about their phones, about leaving the SIM card, getting off at different stations, so that they are able to get to a place where there is safety. And so, for example, in some shelter homes in Delhi, they ask you to leave your phone at the reception. But it's so tough for a queer person who's used that device to get out to freedom, to give up the custody of their phone to anybody. But at the same time, there are now more services in bigger cities. So there is a sort of movement from places where people are being uh, persecuted in smaller places, in smaller towns, uh, to bigger cities. And there are sort of more services uh, in terms of lawyers, shelter homes. Uh, there's a 
set of shelter homes started by the government for trans people. But of course, there's a big issue in terms of funding um, and support from the government. Now, in terms of online dating, I think the apps specifically catering to online dating, many of you must have used them. Uh, there's this kind of promise of freedom, like um, romantic and sexual freedom. The apps allow you to interact with people of same interests, sexual orientation. Uh, you know, a lot of the the awkward initial um, is another person queer, uh, do they have interest in, in women, etc. is all sort of assumed if you're on a platform which is common. But at the same time, there are uh, a lot of risks. So, of course, some of it is common to however you would access physical spaces um, or online spaces. But a lot of it is also built into the architecture of the apps. So Grinder, for example, you can see the person's distance from you. So if Shefali was on Grinder, she'd be like zero meters away from you. There are other apps where you publicly broadcast yourself. There are apps where you can bond over kinks, right? So those all throw up unique challenges, uh, particularly when something goes wrong. And a lot does go wrong. So when you start to move from the online to the offline, the question really is how much is somebody protected, able to protect themselves? Uh, how vulnerable would they be? And what we see in Delhi, for example, there are lots of young students, there are lots of people from different parts of the country, and they may or may not know how unsafe it could be. So there is a targeting of people. So we have criminal gangs active on these apps, and particularly they use the information we share to bond with people to target you and so that could be uh, whether you're out or not you know uh, whether you're married to somebody and you are meeting people um, quietly and all of that is then used to i can range from something like you know extortion and robbery but it has extended to much more serious cases uh, of sexual assault gang rape etc and then the question is of how much do the apps help because if you block the person, all your chat history is gone. And so then the police is always questioning you. Um, did you really meet, etc.? What were you doing on the apps? And that kind of thing. And, you know, if, if, if it's questions of kink and sort of freer expressions, you might have discussed all sorts of things to be done with consent. And if they're done without consent, getting the police to acknowledge that as an offense committed is something that it's really difficult to do. The other thing that we're seeing constantly is the conversion from a request to the police for assistance into sort of mass surveillance and scrutiny on the community. So for example, if there has been violence and it's happened in cases, the police will then use chats that have happened on Grindr on WhatsApp, on Instagram, etc., to go through the entire chat history and start calling people. So then they might out the persons who've chatted with the person concerned. Um, they have very sort of voyeuristic questioning techniques where they're very interested in what sexual acts have been done. Uh, if they found sex toys at a place, they will confront every single person that um, they have summoned uh, with them, etc. And very often it just becomes a way to use any sort of shame perhaps one might have in terms of what they're doing to get money out of them. So the apps also leave a trail uh, when not wanted, but uh, when we need them to work, they don't often uh, support. So if there's sexual assault, and uh, I have represented people who have been assaulted after meeting people, but... Uh, Tinder, Telegram, etc. Despite summons, despite notices, have not come, not assisted, uh, facilitated with the process, etc. So there is a question in terms of how much this promise of freedom uh, really can come from the apps. Uh, I think it's undeniable in terms of how much we are able to deny sort of you know their use in our lives because really for for us, meeting people, dating, etc., is really facilitated by it. 
but at the same time there's this big question of how do we ensure safety and security i'll stop here now cuz my time's up but i'm happy to take questions afterwards